In 2017, Mexican authorities placed a ban on the export of hibiscus flower from Nigeria due to several issues. It's been two years after the ban, and the Director of Federal Produce Inspection Service, Omololu Okwewe, says progress has been made in changing the narrative. Between 2015 and 2017, Nigeria exported over 10,000 metric tons of the commodity, mainly to Mexico and Russia. So Nigeria has a huge market for hibiscus in Mexico. In view of this, our hibiscus flower by the Mexican authority will soon be lifted because of the meeting they have had in my office that they are no more, they do not have the strength again to ban the hibiscus flower from Nigeria. We have enough hibiscus flour in this country. One exporter alone can export as much as 5,000, 10,000 metric tons. One exporter. And we have several of them in states like Jigawa, in states like uh, Kano, in states like uh, Kasina. At the gathering, Okwewe also said the federal government has replaced the 1959 ordinance stress test of cocoa quality with a modern framework that is internationally recognized for cocoa commerce rule. The ordinance for cocoa was what we had been using, but unfortunately is not internationally recognized. It's a lot of money, it costs millions to bring in the FCC International from US to Nigeria. And they were brought to Nigeria last month. It affects, once they see the, the, the stamp of FPIS in US, they will definitely accept the cocoa that is coming from Nigeria. The transformation agenda of federal government demands that attention should be properly given to the development of all the value chains of agriculture. The idea is to grow what we eat and export high quality products that can complete favorably in the international market. The forum agreed that the government has recorded significant progress in the enforcement of quality standards for agro-commodity meant for export and local processing, as well as resolving ensuring that high-quality produce leave the shores of Nigeria for the international market. Christiana Amodo reporting for Moneyline with Nancy. To me, this is the most significant session out of all the sessions packaged, because this is where we talk about the money. So if we want to build the Africa we want, it has a cost. So the question is, how do we get that money? We know that Nigerians, Africans have the attitude of looking for benefits without responsibilities. So we need to demystify that. I don't know what balanced tax system means. I don't know what it means to have a fair tax system. But we are going to have that discussion, that topic being unpacked by our eminent uh, tax administrators. And if you look at the facts coming out, which is incontestable, the infrastructural deficit in Africa requires, on the average, between $130 billion and $170 billion annually. And the highest as at 2018 figures that the premier tax authority in Nigeria has been able to get or collect is $15 billion. So you can see a huge gap. And that is why this particular conversation will focus extensively on how do we improve collection of taxes. And to kick off my question, I will ask uh, the chairman of the FRS that looking at our collection challenges, sir. How much of that problem is a policy problem or legislative problem or 
an administration problem, sir. Well, thank you very much. I think if I was going to qualify the problem, I'll say it has to do with attitude. Um, if you look at the average person in some parts of Lagos, they'll tell you that they're connected to the old NEPA line, enjoying electricity, and they believe they don't have to pay for it. And that has been the story of Nigeria. From the mid-70s, when we found oil in commercial quantities at the right price, and we're funding our respective budgets at the federal and state level, everyone was happy with the sale of oil, not realizing that without taxation, there, can no, there cannot be any sustainable uh, flow of revenue. So now we have a situation of attitude, whereby we want to ask everyone to pay taxes, and they say, what has government done? The question we have to ask ourselves is that, what can government do without money? And so the key thing, is that we should hold each other accountable. For example, if you are going to use an abusive word in Nigeria, you would say foolish or whatever word you like to say. But in some other countries, if they call you a tax dodger, not paying your taxes, that is more of an abusive word than that word foolish. Because you're cheating the society in which you live, you're cheating the society in which you make your own money, and then that is basically a criminal offense. In most Western countries, you'll be behind bars, regardless of whether you're a movie star, a great athlete, or in quotes, an ex-president, because you've cheated the society in which you live by not paying taxes. So it's a question of attitude. When we say everyone should come forward and pay taxes, you'll find out that based on figures that we have, we did a tax amnesty in 2016, we collected 92 billion. VATE came 2017, we collected 77.8 out of 92 billion. Similar figures. And after VATE, we now looked through the banking sector to find those who had banking turnover, annual banking turnover of a billion and above, a hundred million and above. 40, over 40,000 of those account holders were not paying taxes. 3,000 of them have paid 101 billion so far. So that shows you that the conscience to be truthful when it comes to tax payments is not there. The attitude is not there. And when we even talk to people about why you should pay tax, a lot of people still resist it. And I tell them something. If you look at the level of infant mortality in Nigeria, it's the highest in the world, meaning children who die below the age of five from malaria. 2,500 naira will save that life. If everybody decided to pay tax in line with the Constitution, just 2,500 per year, Nigeria will be different. Nobody's going to build Nigeria except we build it for ourselves and by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Abani, you once worked with the HMRC for several years. Do you agree with the FRS chair that it's a question of attitude? What did the UK do to be able to crack that kind of collection problem? Thank you very much. I agree totally with the chair of FRS that it's an attitude problem, but it's a complex attitude problem. Because in other regimes, when you pay your tax, you see your tax in action. Now, now a, lot of us, a lot of us deliberately do not make the connection. And I do know that the focus of the Joint Tax Board and the Chairman of FIRS has been to try and get uh, both the governors and the governments to try and make the connection for people's good. There's a social contract that needs to be in place. However, it's still the issue of the chicken and the egg. You have the right to talk when it's your own money that is inside there. When it was national money, which you didn't seem to be part of collecting or part of paying, it was very easy to say we are not we are, we are not get, going to do anything, but we're in a different paradigm. We're in a completely different place.
So it's perceptions, but the attitudes need to change. And they need to change not just with the revenue, in fact, the revenue authorities caught in between. It's between the politicians, the leaders of our, organ our society, and the people. And it's a two-way street. Leaders need to start leading. They need to start showing transparency and accountability for the money. The example, the example that the chairman has rightly given on the malaria drugs is part of that social contract. No child should die because of malarial issues. But many of us will eat the cost of that malaria in our fish tonight without thinking about putting it back into the system. Sometimes because there's a lack of trust in the system, but we should be putting in that money. There is no question at all about it. The other thing there is, and again, he's, he's made the point about the, the higher net worth individuals. A lot of people in Nigeria should be paying a lot. In fact, they should be paying tax. Let's not even say a lot of tax. They should be paying tax in the first place. In countries like South, America, uh, South Africa, in the US, in the UK, the top 10, 5% of the population pay 80% of the tax. So we need to get the engagement of those at the top of the hierarchy to start to pay the tax to show the example. We also need to have a greater, we spoke about capacity in the previous session, we have a need for greater capacity at all the levels of government because the average person's view of the taxman is not Tunde and FIRS who are very, very professional in their approach and deal with the upper echelon. It's the local government collector. And so we need to work all the way through because once you have given money to one arm of government, even for a service you're enjoying, like you want a receipt for something you're paying for, water, power, they still say it's tax. That's not a tax. That's a charge for a service you're getting. And some of the moves to pay as you go will drive us through the same way it went for telecoms, will drive us to start to understand the difference between the taxes you pay, which are compulsory, and you don't decide where they are going to, and the charges that you pay on the other side. Not all payments to government are taxed. So in the UK, you get something for something. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Naiju, as a former tax administrator and accountant general of the Federation, what do you think is not being done from a Pan-African tax administration point of view around the collection issues? Thank you so much. Uh, I think you said it. I think I... I, I saw it very well. And when I look at the Nigerian society, I think what the chairman said is right. But the attitude goes beyond. There is complete, what I can see, a flagrant uh, inequality of the sharing of the, what is expected to be tax burden. In, in, the, in Africa generally, Nigeria in particular. What do I mean by that? As far back as 17th century, when uh, Adam Smith was trying to postulate the canons of what should make a good tax system, the first thing he said was that there must be, the equity concept must be there. That means equality of the sharing of the tax burden. We want to be honest with ourselves. I wish the politicians who are just poking are still behind. <laughs> and why I don't like too much of workshop talking is that we talk and talk and talk. They go back to their ivory tower and they do what they like. But I think what the chairman is, has said is true, but I can pierce it deeper that there is unfairness on the Nigerian taxpayers.
impressive. Um, noting the fact that uh, it is the first session, this is the first time that the program is being organized, and uh, there may be some teasing challenges, but I can see even from the first uh, uh, program to, uh, that starts today that uh, attendance is uh, very high and caliber of people that have come. And the expectation is, number one, there are topical issues, apart of issues relating to a Nigerian context, issues relating to ease of doing business, issues relating to the border closure, as well as the uh, recently agreed African continental free trade area. Now, there are maybe a lot of challenges. There are huge opportunities. In Africa, we don't trade among ourselves. We trade with the rest of the world. And in trading with ourselves, we must do it legally. So the context of border closure, issue of um, illegal importations, all those things are teasing issues that need to be you know, addressed for Africa to truly grow. It, is, it, it doesn't make any sense having a Benin Republic being the second or the, or the, or the largest importer of rice with, with 12 or 15 million people only to push it on to Nigeria. While Nigerian government are working, is, is working hard towards ensuring that we produce what we eat. We can never produce what we eat if we have imports coming in from somewhere. It's about time because Africa ought to have moved far much higher than she is right now at the moment. So this conference is very apt. This conference is basically what we need to iron out all the teething problems and see how we can jumpstart growth in so many spheres. It's about time, and I'm very optimistic. One key point of note is the absence of strong legislations. Because you cannot have adequate growth when you don't have adequate laws in place. The expectation is that we should work harder than our forefathers to make the African economy better than we met it. It appears we are, we are not growing the African economy. That is my own perception. We need to do more than we are doing now. If China could, in less than 70 years, grow to the extent it has today, Africa should have done better. If China could go to Britain, buy their abandoned steel plants, restructure them, learn from them, build their own steel plants that are serving better today, Africa will have every opportunity from developed nations to copy. Technology is copied. In a very impactful one, um, listening to His Excellency um, Peter Obi, he has really shared a lot of knowledge to especially we the young people on leadership, um, the situations in the country. Um, it's been impactful and knowledgeful. So for me, a uh, key reason for coming here was to come and learn and acquire one or two um, ideas here and there. I think this program is centered on the organized private sector. So, so far, sir, you participated yesterday, sir. Yes. So, what are some of the key takeaways for you from yesterday's session? Yeah, a lot was said, but on border closure, a lot of papers, a lot of economists, a lot of policy makers spoke. But the most important thing why I want to tell Africans, because we've been having series of meetings, this African Economic Congress is centered on what do we want African to do for themselves? 
you have to start from somewhere. Every time the Americans have program for Africa, the Asians have program for Africa, the European Union have program for Africa. But what do Africans have for themselves? This is something that we can do. I come here to have experience of um, economic development, number one. Number two, first of its kind, African Economic uh, Summit. It's a very, very intelligent summit that I would like everyone from the rural area, the governors, the chairman, the parliamentary, the judiciary. She started very well and she's growing very well. We are proud of her as a woman. You know, we women, we can plan and execute. Oh, mm. I, I, I came here, I registered, I paid money to attend the conference so as to gain from how to develop my own uh, business from the rural area. As you know, in the whole Africa, women contribute 75% of the strength of economy in all the African countries, including Nigeria, where we belong to. Energy has done a very good job that she needs to be recommended because men are seeing it. We've come decade on decade. We don't have market to sell our products. We don't know what the African Union are doing. Because Nigeria have a lot, both human resources, natural resources, everything that you can think of Nigeria as the giant of Africa. But what are we doing? The closer of the, the, the border, it will help for so many reasons, but it shouldn't take so long because it's, we've not, we are not used to it. And nothing good come easy. For a Nigerian person that smuggles things in and out, Thank you.